Hi, my name is Julia Estomina, and I am the Associate Director of the Yale Graduate Writing Lab at the Porvu Center for Teaching and Learning. I also run the Public Communication Certificate Program. We are really excited to offer this workshop on enhancing your online presence with Guy Ortaliva from the Yale Broadcast Studio. This workshop is geared to Yale students competing in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences three-minute thesis competition or recording online videos to complete the certificate. But it is also extremely valuable to students, postdocs, and faculty, and to anyone doing online presentations, from conference panels to job talks to that important Zoom call. In this video tutorial, Guy's advice covers everything from strategies to frame yourself right, to make sure you have good lighting, to enhance your audio quality, all the way to making clothing choices that don't distract from your message. As background, Guy worked in broadcast television for many years. Now at Yale, he has recorded and edited thousands of on-camera presentations. I am now going to turn this over to Guy. Thank you for watching, and we hope you find this presentation useful for your next video pitch. I did have quite a few years working in television, but for the past two years uh, at Yale, uh, it, since COVID, much of my time is looking at Zoom recordings from all around the world and all the guest lecturers, and then editing them and trying to put them on YouTube and wherever they're going to go. And I've seen a lot. So hopefully today, um, I can show you how to improve your image on Zoom, and then specifically we'll talk about the 3MT uh, types of recordings. When asked uh, why the show 60 Minutes was so successful for so many years, executive producer Don Hewitt said, tell me a story. And that's pretty much it. The success of that show has been that every Sunday night they tell you a story. And that's what you're doing when you're doing your 3MT or anytime you're really doing a presentation on Zoom. You have to have a beginning, you have to have a middle, and an end. And after we've gotten MTV <laughs> in the 80s, everything happens a lot faster. And I think it's very important for you to get the attention of your audience in the first 15 seconds. Give them a reason to really continue paying attention to you. And then at the end, you want to wrap it up with some real impact. And in the middle, you're providing all of the content. And again, you want to hold people's attention throughout. You have to be dynamic. Um, I found what was helpful in uh, planning for any presentation that I do, that I have a one sentence objective. Can I sum up what I want the takeaway to be, what I want people to leave with, uh, in one sentence. And then as I prepare my material, I hold it up to that one sentence. Nice. Is this a need to know or a nice to know? One of the things to keep in mind when you're presenting on camera, in an, or if you have slides or however you're presenting it, people can assimilate one thing or another. They can't assimilate your sound and a slide at the same time. They're, the balance is gonna tip one way or the other. So you've got something really compelling to say, you don't want the slide to be distracting. And if the slide has the information that you really need to be showing, well, keep in mind that people are gonna be looking at the slide and your voice is gonna be kind of in the background. And what people are seeing of you has to be useful. Uh, be careful of your background uh, material. Uh, be careful of your clothing. We'll talk about clothing later. Uh, but everything that's in the frame has to be useful <laughs> um, and not detract from you. So framing, lighting, and audio is how you successfully tell a story. And that's what we're going to cover today. Um, proper framing really is, for example, I'm in a fairly balanced view. You can see me pretty well. Um, I have a little bit of headroom. Um, background is totally in, in the <laughs> fallen away. You don't really notice it. The lighting's pretty good. You can see my eyes. Uh, the audio quality is pretty good. And people, you can understand what I'm saying. Um, the framing, the lighting, and the audio is really important. Everything else is nice, but if you fail any of those above, um, you're in trouble. And again, we're going to discuss the three-minute thesis specific things a little bit later on. Um, this fellow, Jeff Carlson, uh, kindly did a number of images. And this is what I see 
with so many different Zoom meetings. You have a variety of different images. And the first one is that not enough headroom uh, or the up the nose. This is the same thing with opening your laptop. We're looking up at you, uh, but you're cutting the top of your head off. Uh, you want to avoid looking up so much you're seeing the ceiling and all that other stuff. Second image, too much backlight. And that's where you have a window or a bright light source behind you. Uh, as we'll talk about later, the camera averages the amount of light. So if you've got a lot of bright light behind you, your face is going to be dark. Uh, or worse, if you have like a window and you start moving your head one way, or the camera will open up, you know, you get that almost pulsating look of the camera will open up the iris and then close it down quickly. Um, a plain white background is not so great. It kind of looks like a mugshot, which <laughs> you don't want to really do. And then when you have too much headroom, um, and this is the other example I use with Julia there, too much headroom is not so good. Uh, you've all seen the movie Alien, and you've probably seen lots of scary movies. And when the music starts playing and you just know something bad is going to happen, an alien, the monster comes down from above, well, the reason you know that is because they've added a little extra room in the direction of where the bad thing is about to happen. So I've always said that when you have too much headroom, that's because there's going to be a monster descending upon you. So be careful with extra headroom. Uh, busy background. Uh, there's lots of kind of busy backgrounds. One of the ones that I see a lot of uh, are bookcases. And what happens, you've got a busy background, and after a while, your voice drones on, and people are really reading the spines of the, uh, the titles and the books behind you. They want to see what you're reading. They're not listening to you anymore. So when you have a busy background, keep in mind that that is going to be distracting. And what's the main topic? You. You want to avoid distracting people. And of course, in the bottom right is the good balance that we were looking for. Uh, before I go on to any kind of a Zoom meeting, any of them, um, I open up my Zoom preferences and I take a look at what I look like and make sure that um, I have my uh, background is, is relatively nice, make sure my camera is on HD. Um, and then I also go to the audio and make sure that I've got a reasonably good audio. The green bar, um, when you do a test audio, should go about halfway to three quarters of the way to the right. Uh, that's gonna give you a really, really pretty good sound. And I do this before any time I go on, and I encourage you to do the same thing because you wanna see what you look like, and you wanna also make sure that your audio is good. So do this before each meeting. And what people will see. Uh, there's a rule of thumb in video editing, uh, in any kind of thing with camera, but it's built into our DNA that the first thing that people will be looking for when they look at a frame are other people's eyes. It's just natural. Um, the next thing they'll look for is motion, if there's anything motion in the frame. And then after they've satisfied themselves with the eyes and any motion, they're gonna start looking around for the brightest light and then finally details. But I'll go back to the eyes. Um, I remember years ago, my son had a, a lizard, <laughs> a little chameleon, cute little thing. But anytime you walk by the room or walked in the room or was anywhere around him, he looked you right in the eyes. All animals, all creatures, all people will first look into your eyes. And that's important because you gotta make sure that your eyes are well enough lit and that they're large enough in the frame that people are gonna see them. Otherwise, they're gonna be looking around. Um, the next thing is also your body language. Uh, people tend to um, gesture your hand out like that, which is great. Uh, if you're dynamic enough speaker, a lot of times people will be going like this and you'll be carrying people's attention. But your body language has to be useful. This doesn't help. Uh, you're putting up a barrier. But your body language is an important part and as well as how you look. We'll cover clothing later, but it's your visual presentation of what you look like on camera that says a lot. Also, are you going to be in the frame with the slide? Uh, I know with the 3MT you're using Panopto, so you're going to be side, long side, you're to the left side of the, uh, of the slide. 
Uh, in Zoom, a lot of times, if you've got slides, you're going to be in the upper right-hand corner. So you've got to anticipate how that will look. The best thing is to have frame yourself up with a close-up or what we call a medium close-up, not your entire body. Uh, because again, the eyes, which is what people are going to be looking for, you want them to be seen. And then whatever slides you have, well, they've got to be telling a story and they should amplify what it is that you're saying. Because remember, it's your spoken word and how you make your presentation that really carries the day. The slide is just amplifying it or reinforcing you. Uh, and speaking of slides, uh, you got to make sure that any images or video clips or anything you have have been cleared with copyright. Um, you can easily get stuff from Wikimedia Commons and other places, or you can ask permission. Um, the, the best thing to do is get these things clear because your video, your presentation may end up on YouTube. And if it does, um, they'll pick it off if you're borrowing somebody's material without, without permission. When you're speaking to an audience, you got to be on the same level. I mean, you don't like it when you have to look up at somebody. And just opening your laptop and starting to talk doesn't cut it anymore. You really have to put yourself at the same level as the camera. You should be lit twice as bright as your background, uh, and that will create a separation from your background. So you're going to have to probably use some kind of lights, either daylight coming in or maybe a light on the table or something. And that light should be near the lens. So it's not casting big shadows, but it's not blinding you either. Um, if you're lost in the framing, in other words, if you've chosen to show all of your body or most of it, rather than a medium close-up or a close-up, it's going to take away from your story. I'm here to tell you, <laughs> especially if they put you up in the corner or along the side when you're showing some slides, you're going to be lost in the frame. And audio. Uh, you got to do the audio well enough so that people really understand you. You can get headsets, you can use your earbuds, or best of all, use some kind of a cardioid microphone, something that's directional. Uh, the microphone should be no more than two or three feet away. I always say an iPhone sounds great as long as you have it close enough. Choosing a background can be as simple as opening up your laptop, um, getting up your Zoom, image so you see yourself, and then walk around to different places in your house. Find a good background, something that has some nice soft light or available light coming in so it's lighting your face, has a pleasing background. But move around, find the best place. You might find two or three places. Um, I know my wife, unfortunately, took the best place. She does telemedicine, so I found myself down in the basement doing my Zoom <laughs> events. But find yourself with a good background. Uh, windows can hurt you if you've got them behind you, uh, and you want to avoid large, flat surfaces that will start reflecting the sound. Um, more of a cluttered room, at least on the side so we don't see it, uh, can help break up some of that sound. Uh, two most common errors in camera work. The low angle shot, uh, one of my colleagues is along here in the upper left hand corner image, and you see he's got his eye line is above the camera. And this happens typically, people open up their laptop, bring themselves on a Zoom meeting and start talking. So you're kind of looking up their nose. Um, and then uh, you've got too much headroom. And so the, the headroom, you gotta just tilt the monitor down. Uh, and the, of course, the bottom right, we have an example of proper headroom. Back to framing. Uh, we do in television something called rule of sixes. We divide an image up with uh, six lines and six areas. And this image of me <laughs> kind of shows the way you want to balance yourself out in a frame if you're looking straight forward. Uh, you have a little bit of headroom, uh, not too much underneath. So that's, this is what's called a medium close-up. And that's probably your best bet. Your eyes are going to be visible enough. I have one of these um, backgrounds because, again, I'm downstairs and I don't want to show <laughs> what's behind me. So I use one of these virtual backgrounds. But what I do is throw it out of focus a little bit. 
So, you know, put it in Photoshop, soften it up, and that way it's not distracting, or at least hopefully not distracting, from the speaker. Now, the alternative framing is, as mentioned, if you've got slides, um, the person's going to be in the upper right-hand corner, and it shows me I'm probably blocking Julia. But if I'm looking at one side and I'm looking over here, I'm looking out of frame. So you want to be looking in the direction of your slides because if you're looking in the direction of the slides, if somebody's looking at your eyes, their eyes are going to be led back into frame where the slides are and paying attention to the slides. But if you're looking out of frame, well, what happens? People look at your eyes and they're lost. They're not looking anywhere. So keep in mind, when you're doing a long presentation, you may want to have a script there. You could put it in the upper side of your upper upper part of your frame, but just make sure you put it in the proper side so that you're not inadvertently looking out of frame. Remember, the eyes are the key. Uh, people are going to look in your eyes, and again, when you're in a small frame in the upper right-hand corner on um, a zoom image, uh, or even on the 3MTs when you're off to the side, you're a smaller picture out of necessity. So you want to have that medium close-up shot so that we can see you, because um, your face is what's really important. Uh, but avoid drawing attention away from the subject matter, which is you and or your slides. And so how does a camera see? Well, it sees like we do. Uh, it has an iris. So in this image, you know, when you have a little bright light, you squint a little bit, or your eyes will, your iris will open up to bring in more light. And a camera is pretty much the same, only it's not quite the same. It's not adjustable infinitely. It adjusts to the limit of its technology, but it has something called auto iris. It averages the amount of light. So in a situation where you have bright light behind you, the camera is going to average the amount of light and it's going to close its iris down because it thinks it's got plenty of light. But what happens is now you're darker. And when technology averages, it's not so good. So for example, if your head is in an oven and your feet are in the freezer, a computer might say, hmm, on average, that person is quite comfortable. So averaging in technology isn't always your best friend. And it also happens uh, when you have color. And one of the questions that people will ask me sometimes when they've seen themselves on a Zoom is, why am I orange? Why am I orange? Well, it happens because the camera is averaging not just the amount of light, but it's looking at the kind of light or the color of light. So in other words, if you have daylight or in the surface a lot of white walls with having daylight reflecting off of it, the camera thinks that, well, this is more outside. So it's going to adjust itself to one end of the color spectrum. And if you have an incandescent light on, on your desk, your face is going to be orange. Quick, simple solution for this is to buy some daylight bulbs to put in your lamp. And what about this color difference? If you remember the old uh, electromagnetic spectrum from back in uh, your science class days, the visible spectrum is from the low end, which is the reds, all the way up to your blues. So a candlelight is at the one end, the low end of the spectrum. It's very warm. Uh, your incandescent bulbs that most people have in their houses um, are on the low end of the spectrum. Uh, we measure color temperature in kelvins, or K, we call it. So for example, your typical bulb that you have in your house, your soft white bulb, is around 2600 Kelvin, 2600 K, we call it. Daylight, on the other hand, uh, is probably around 56 K. And a screaming blue sky could be maybe 10,000 K. So it's way up in the blue end of the spectrum. So if let's say you have a situation where you've got some nice soft daylight coming in, but you also have a lamp on your uh, 
uh, helping to eliminate your, uh, illuminate your face, you want to make sure that the two color temperatures are not fighting one another. So if the camera looks at the light and averages it, and it says, gee, we're at the blue end of the spectrum, and you put some orange light on your face, you're going to look orange, your background's going to look fine. So again, that's where the daylight bulb as an option for your light fixtures uh, will come in. And the other opposite end happens too. Um, there have been a few times that I turn on my camera and I'm blue. Why? Because I overcompensated uh, and I had a blue shirt on. Um, so sometimes, you know, it will, the cameras will pick up on your clothing too and say, oh, gee, we're, we're outdoors. So again, take a look at yourself. But the typical situation that comes in that becomes a problem is when the camera sees a lot of daylight adjust for one end of the spectrum, the blue end, and then you have an incandescent bulb, and now you look a little orange. So you want to compensate that with a daylight bulb. Natural light versus artificial light. Uh, if you're in the upper left-hand corner, wouldn't it be nice that all our Zoom meetings could have nice, soft light coming in through big windows? That person looks great. Um, but we don't all have that luxury. So the person in the lower left has nice daylight coming in. You see it coming in and it's illuminating her face. In other words, it's in front of her, not behind her. We don't actually really know what's behind her, but humor me here. You have a lot of daylight coming, soft daylight illuminating your face. But then she also has a lamp on her desk to help illuminate herself a little bit more. And that would be a classic situation where you put a daylight bulb in it. Now, people have decided that they need more light uh, when they do all their Zoom meetings. So enter the ring light. Uh, a lot of people go out and buy these ring lights. And they're OK uh, unless you put it right dead above the lens of your camera. And then if you see the Jeff Carlson image in the upper right-hand corner, you start seeing a reflection of the ring light in your glasses or in your eyes. You'll see like a little circle of light. The best thing to do is to put your light off to the side. My rule of thumb in lighting any situation is that I always take the light and move it one foot over and one foot above the lens. That's typically my starting point in any kind of a lighting situation. So if you're going to have any extra lights, that would probably be a good place to start. And then you fine tune it a little bit as you go along. What we will hear. Audio is really important. In any kind of a online presentation or any kind of a recording, people will kind of forgive not so good images. But if they don't understand the audio, you lost them. They're gone. So your audio has to be good quality. It has to be clear. Um, the microphone, you should have a directional microphone if you can, or earbuds, or a headset. Or if you're going to use your laptop microphone, you got to have it closer. You can't have it any more than two to three feet away. So always remember, you have picture and sound. Um, an iPhone, some people when they're doing their recordings will use their iPhone. Just make sure it's no more than arm's length away from you. Set it up on a bookcase or on a tripod or something like that so it's at eye level and um, make sure it's close enough. Now, Zoom does have those controls uh, for uh, improving your sound. Uh, I found that a USB microphone if you can find them, actually now they're not hard to find. When uh, COVID first happened, it was difficult to find one of these USB microphones. But let's go through a little bit of a dive a little deeper into audio. The sound waves from your voice, or any kind of sound, hit the diaphragm inside the microphone. It vibrates, and that creates an electrical signal. The closer you are to the microphone, the better unless you're too close, and then you'll distort it. Uh, most microphones have um, different pickup patterns, so you have to be aware of that. In the bottom picture, 
you have the, the microphone on the left is what we call an omnidirectional microphone. It hears equally in all directions. Whereas the second one, that's a cardioid, it's a heart-shaped pattern, and that picks up more directionally, which is actually your best in this situation. And then you have other patterns, um, especially in the one in the bottom right, um, in that uh, blue window there. That's a figure eight pattern. So that's wonderful for um, podcast when you have one microphone for two people on, an e on either side. Now the picture on the, the, the right gives you kind of an idea of what we call the fall off or the, the dB or decibel pattern. You'll see that right at the surface of the microphone, you got 25 dB but it doesn't take much for it to fall off to like 5 dB. So you have a significant loss in audio quality uh, by not being close enough to the microphone. So the, the way this manifests itself is that if you have a microphone far away, it's picking up more of the room noise and you're gonna sound echoey and it's not gonna be that clear and distinct. Um, this is a closer shot of my microphone. I, I use a Yeti microphone here. Uh, and you'll see that it does have a gain control on it, but more importantly, it has that little pickup pattern. That's the, uh, the, the center image there. You wanna make sure it's on that cardioid or heart-shaped pattern. Uh, I know so many people get themselves a microphone and then forget to set it where it needs to be. And then you always go on to your Zoom preferences and you do your test audio and play around with it. So before you do your all important recording or meeting, test the microphone, make sure that you don't have the mute button pushed on it, which I've done more than once, and uh, see if you can get a good clean sound where the green bar goes about two thirds, about two thirds to three quarters of the way to the right. Distance between me and the microphone and you get a good sound and now you're ready for your important meeting because people really, really understand you. So some audio tips. Um, pay attention to your environment and do this when you're selecting a location to do your recording. So not only is it a good background, but stop and be quiet for a moment and listen. Are you hearing some noises that you can either turn off or you can avoid? Uh, everything from the refrigerator that might come on to, um, I, I know some rooms you, you hear the, the, the pipes or you hear um, just the sound of the, the air, air handlers. So avoid situations like that. Uh, yeah, it is obvious, but silence your phone and your emails and all that other stuff because they will go off right in the middle of your best recording. Uh, rustling of papers, tapping on the table. I've got my little... Um, a clicker over here. Uh, you don't want to have it tapping on surfaces or setting down. But rustling papers, especially if you're reading from a script, uh, that can really be picked up very quickly and easily. Also consider your surfaces. Um, sound waves bounce. So in other words, if you have a lot of large flat surfaces, the sound waves will bounce off of that and come back into the microphone and especially consider behind you. If you have a big flat wall behind you, guess what happens? Your voice goes out, it gets picked up on the microphone, bounces off of surfaces, and comes back into the microphone. That's what gives you that echoey, muddy sound. So always pay attention to flat surfaces, break it up, you know, a couple chairs here and there, uh, curtains, um, but also pay attention to what's behind you. Um, I know that that, Believe it or not, I was working in this industry for many years, and we used to make these little um, sound booths, and you put foam on it, and you could actually buy them, but, but so we used to be able to do voiceovers. And I remember talking to some real rock and roll expert who, who had done so many recordings with bands and stuff like that, and I was saying, yeah, you know, we got this nice foam stuff and it was okay, but for some reason, the sound still isn't great. He says, Guy, what's behind you? He says, uh, The wall. You idiot. The bounce, the sound is bouncing off the wall. Oh, sorry. 
So after that, we always put some curtains or something behind. So, you know, it's not intuitive, it's behind you, but those large flat surfaces behind you can actually be muddying your sound because the sound waves are bouncing off them and hitting the microphone a little bit after your voice did. Clothing choices. Um, white, black can, certainly black can be very slimming, um, but remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to show off your face. If you have a black shirt on and the camera is saying, oh gee, I don't have enough light. Let me open up the iris because it's all very dark. Well, now your face is gonna to be too bright. So you have to pay attention to your clothing, first of all, as to, you know, it has to be pleasant and something that you wanna wear, but you also wanna make sure it's not giving you some technical problems. If you have a lot of white or black, it can sometimes trick the camera's iris into doing things that you didn't really want it to do. So we often recommend people use kind of neutral clothing, pastels, off-whites, grays, browns, uh, and blues. Uh, that usually works best. It's certainly easier for us when we're lighting people, but it'll be easier for you to adjust the camera, which will automatically be adjusting. Uh, greens are good, unless you're doing chroma key, because most of the chroma keys are green screens. Television computers really don't do reds very well, or oranges, uh, or pinks. Uh, they get confused. They don't really, really know how to distinguish them that well. You can wear them, uh, but just keep in mind that it is going to be a little bit more of a challenge for the camera. Um, avoid pinstripes, real thin pinstripes or herringbone, any kind of a close pattern. And the reason for that is that the way the image is being created is the, it's scanning back and forth. The electrons are scanning back and forth, and that's how television, video, whatever, is able to create an image. And in that scanning back and forth, thin patterns confuse the camera. Um, and so you'll have a what we call a moiré pattern. If you have a very thin pinstripe or, or herringbone, it'll look like worms are crawling up your shirt, which is not good. Um, avoid high contrast. Uh, you don't want to be mixing black and white because, again, the, you're, you're thinking for the camera, and that's the terrible thing is we're, we're dealing with technology here, and we have to think for it. Uh, you have to anticipate how it's going to react. Uh, jewelry, yeah, that can be an issue. Um, but, you know, you, you want to dress the way you feel comfortable. Uh, just take a look at it. And that, that's kind of the rule of thumb of a lot of this. Make sure you look at yourself before you do the recording and see if you can make an improvement here and there. But the bottom line is it's setting you up to look good and make it visible, your eyes visible. You want to be able to see uh, the person because you're the one that's the subject matter and it's your presentation, what you're saying and how you look that's really selling your story. PowerPoint slides, uh, you're gonna have them. Um, and again, I, I understand with the 3MT, you're gonna be um, long side of your PowerPoint. Uh, in most of us, the zoom puts us in the upper hand corner, upper right hand corner. Uh, but you wanna make sure that you're using widescreen. Um, you wanna make sure that your slides are supporting your story, not uh, replacing it or distracting people. Uh, 1920 by 1080, you gotta remember this number. 1920 by 1080, which is widescreen, it's the old 16 by nine. About 10, 15 years ago, everything went widescreen. So the old four by three kind of squarish image that we used to watch on television, that's kind of gone. Unfortunately, PowerPoint still has that as a default. So you wanna make sure that when you're creating your slides, you select widescreen. And it gives you more workable area too. I find that it's better to use a dark background with white or light text. Uh, again, I'm, I'm adverse to having bright white sources uh, or light sources that are distracting. Because, again, the rule of thumb, when people are looking in any given frame, they're gonna look at eyes first, then they're gonna look for motion, and then they're gonna look for the brightest spot. So if your slide is very bright and white, 
it, it's only natural, but it's going to be a little bit of, a little distracting. Uh, visibility, resolution, you want to just think about how people are seeing your image. Are they going to be looking at it on a cell phone or an iPad? Uh, sure, everything looks great at arm's length with a laptop or a computer, but what will that slide look like when it's reduced to a smaller image? And again, remember your copyright. Uh, do proper attribution. You want to not be surprised down the road that you borrowed something that you shouldn't and in this world of everything online still lives there, people can find it and they'll be not happy if you just go ahead and use their stuff without asking. Uh, and just to help illustrate the PowerPoint, uh, not every presentation you do will always be seen at arm's length. Uh, it may be on a screen um, in a room, in a conference room. And so think about how people in the back of the room are going to be seeing it. If you have a lot of white on your slide, it's going to be difficult for, you know, I'm here I'm talking about how the camera would adjust for, but also for people. Uh, if you have a lot of white, your eyes are like adjusting for the room and the people, and now the images are kind of blown out. Uh, whereas if you kind of adjust your camera to see a slide that has a lot of white, everything else is going to be a little darker. So again, this is another plug for putting darker slides, uh, darker background slides with um, light text. Uh, and only natural, a lot of logos and other images that you have are on white. So you can crop them and then drop them in as appropriate. Uh, this isn't a, another way, just your, use your Photoshop or any of your uh, software to just crop it. So now let's talk about the 3MT, uh, three minute thesis. Uh, since you have a very short amount of time to tell your story, obviously you have to decide what is the need to know from the nice to know. Uh, this is where making that objective what do you want people to really walk away with at the end of your three minutes? Uh, so your visuals are going to amplify your story, but keep in mind that if you've got a complicated slide or you re tell people to look at the slide, they're not going to be hearing your voice quite as much. Again, we assimilate uh, a picture or sound, not both equally. Uh, if you're going to be in the frame with the slides, uh, and anticipate it. And again, in this situation, you're going to be to the left. You're going to be along the side of the, the image. Um, I find that it's better to initiate, you make your, your first contact. Remember your first 15 seconds, you're drawing people in. Talk a little bit, refer to the slide, and then back to you so that people know when they're, they should look at the slide instead of being distracted, and then come back to you uh, and make sure that your, your important points are being heard with their full attention and not kind of a distracted attention where they're looking at the slides and looking at you and what do they really want to concentrate on. Uh, obviously, if you can trim out some portions that are not needed, but most importantly, you want to be dynamic. You want to bring that story to life and give yourself time so that you're not rushing it. Uh, maybe it should be a two and a half minute thesis planned to fill in for three minutes. So here's a few examples. Uh, if you notice the framing, uh, the way you're going to be recording these is on Panopto, so that's going to put you along the side. And unfortunately, it's going to leave a lot of dead space in the top and bottom, which is all the more reason why you want to make sure that your slide is not too cluttered. Uh, in this situation, he was a very dynamic speaker. He framed himself such that you could see his hands, and that's okay if you're going to be dynamic. Uh, the background's a little plain. Uh, it's not bad, but when you have a background that that's that, that simple, you got to make sure you have enough light on your face because you're going to have reflected light too. But this fellow had broken slides into logical patterns, so he talked. He referred to the first part of his slide, then back to him, and then to the middle, and then to the latter part. So he kind of broke his slides up into a logical fashion, and then his presentation referred to it and then back. It was very successful. Uh, this person 
did a very similar type thing. You notice that her framing is much closer, much easier to see her eyes. Um, she wasn't one that was gesturing that much, uh, but her slides also were very logically laid out. Uh, it was easy for the eye to follow those things and then come back to her and not be stuck on the slide trying to figure it out. Um, it was uncluttered, which was really nice. Um, this image, okay, I'm going to kind of toss it to you. Uh, what do you think about this? Right. His camera level is a little low, and so we're seeing, seeing a ceiling. Uh, the background is a little cluttered, but not bad. I, I don't think this one really is that bad. But I think the most important thing is to get the camera at eye level. You want to do that, and then, you know, he still would have been fairly well lit, but seeing the light fixture up above him is going to confuse the camera. So I think if he had gotten himself at eye level, everything else kind of would have taken care of itself. But it also gives you, is this a situation where you would want to use one of those virtual backgrounds or the soft focus ones? Uh, I think those are fine. Uh, it keeps you from being distracted by the background. The only thing that you get to keep in mind in using the virtual backgrounds is to make sure it's, it's a clean, what we call a clean mask. In other words, you don't see any residual image as the person, you, know, you move your head. And you've probably seen if you used a virtual background. When you move a little bit, sometimes the camera, uh, the technology doesn't continue making a nice clean image around you. It's kind of a, like soft and sometimes you'll actually see a little bit of the background. So try things out. In a circumstance like this, you could argue that aside from getting at eye level, you could argue that maybe the background is a little too busy and you want to go with a soft focus virtual background, or you could just go with what it is. Um, his slides, again, you're actually looking at the eyes of the zebra for a second there too. Um, so, you know, make sure your slides are easily visible. You're not wasting any space because in a situation like this, you're going to be, your slide is only about one-third of the usable uh, entire screen. So, you know, plan accordingly. Uh, going back to images and legal issues and stuff like that, uh, since I do have a JD, I have to think about these things. Uh, you want to be careful of your copyright and make sure you get permissions and all that stuff. And the old saying, if you do it right, you can sleep at night. Uh, when I upload videos to the uh, Yale YouTube channel, I am continuously amazed that within a minute, sometimes seconds, I will know whether there was a legal issue and there's a copyright issue, usually with music. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get the material and we edit it and we put it up and you don't realize that the presenter had something in it. But on YouTube and, and any of these online things, they were able to pick up misused images and certainly misused sound. Uh, so you want to be careful. And it's as simple as sending an email to the person that you're using their images and just ask permission. Um, speaker permission forms. Uh, the rule of thumb is that if you're using somebody's name and likeness, they need to give permission. Uh, so you may have been asked to sign uh, a release form for your three MTs or any other time that you're using a, a guest speaker. Alternatively, uh, in some cases, you can put a notice at the beginning that says the event is being recorded and it gives you an option out. Uh, or when you option in, you know that you're being recorded and it may be, become public. Uh, and yes, your presentation may be seen on YouTube. All of you, if that's one of the places that material that we do goes. Uh, the Yale Office of General Counsel has a website. Um, they do have some legal information and some guidance. And they have something called a fair use tool. If you have questions about whether what you're using is, you know, fulfills the exclusion from copyright for what's called fair use, they have a, a tool and uh, you could just look at it. Uh, basically, fair use is a four-point balancing test uh, where you're looking at 
different elements of the image and balancing it to see whether it tips the balance to, yeah, that's fair use, go ahead and use it, to, yeah, that's not really fair use, you're probably gonna get in trouble. So that's one thing to consider. So bottom line, you're gonna successfully communicate your story on this, right? When you're online, you're telling a story. Keep in mind that people can assimilate the spoken word or your images, but not necessarily at the same time, certainly not equally at the same time. The um, video resolution is important. Uh, many people do look at things on cell phones or iPads. Uh, just keep in mind, I, I, I told you to remember the 1920 by 1080, that's your full resol resolution for high definition. It may be squeezed down to 1280 by 720. That's still your 16 by nine aspect ratio. But if things get squeezed down, is your slide gonna be so detailed that we don't see it? Or it's gonna be so detailed that people are spending their time trying to figure it out and they're not paying attention to you. So again, that's a plug for making sure that your slides are not cluttered. Uh, and remember about the slides is they should be supporting your important spoken points. Uh, your spoken word is going to carry the day. That's gonna decide whether you are successful in communicating your story or not. The slides will help, but it's your spoken word that's going to make the difference. And if you're on a slide, your voice is reinforcing the visuals. So in other words, if you've called people's attention to the slide and you want them to be looking at it, Keep in mind that they're gonna now be focused on that and they're gonna be reading it. And your voice is not so important. So that's not the time when you put your, make your most important point. You wanna get people back to you and then you can make your, your, your point. But above all, you're telling a story with your voice and your visuals. So hopefully that helped you get uh, your online presentation uh, and your staging in order. And don't forget the evaluation form. And so we can uh, stop the screen sharing and maybe we can get on to some of these uh, questions. Thank you so much, guys. So virtual hand claps, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> from everybody. And I had I was tracking some excellent questions. So I think I'll just throw them your way. I'll keep my camera off, you know, and. Um, does that sound like a good, good? <laughs> sure. So uh, before we move on to the first question, um, can people reach out to you guys if they have questions about their own presentations or logistical questions? Is that all right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I know you're very responsive on email yep, as well. Yep, so, yep. Wonderful. Okay. So my first question is from Linda. Uh, this is a, a, bit, a bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, Linda wrote, my Zoom puts the speaker directly to the right of the slides centered on the vertical axis, dot, mm -hmm. dot, dot. Is that a setting? That's fine. Yeah, that is a setting. Um, there is a side-by-side -side view or the upper upper view. Um, I think in the recording, it will always put it in the upper right-hand corner, but in the actual, what you see at the time you're doing it, uh, it's along the side. I frankly prefer it along the side, <laughs> if you ask me. Uh, because when it's in the upper right-hand corner, it sometimes obscures part of your uh, PowerPoint. So. Um, Carson asks, would you recommend that we either use an image background or a blurred background? My only real-life background options are white walls or bookshelves. Um, you can try with the... Uh, Image, uh, again, one suggestion is to try and, and soften it so it's not so sharp. Like for example, I had behind me a, a picture I took when we were out hiking, uh, and I looked at it and I said, well, that looks really, really nice, um, but it's too nice, it's gonna be distracting. So I did made it soft focused a little bit so it's not as prominent. Um, I kind of like the soft focus background on these virtual backgrounds, um, it, they, as long as it's not seeing a bright light behind you, that can be a, a pretty good choice. Or again, if you've got an image that you're comfortable with and it's not distracting, and I think that's kind of the guiding principle there. Uh, is it distracting and drawing the attention away from uh, the viewer? Uh, that you don't want to do. 
Yeah, and Carson's right there with his image, so maybe you, you can look at it right now. It's just slightly blurred, but actually, in the in the six paint panel example that you were giving about like good and bad ways to to kind of put yourself in front of the lens, there is a bookshelf in the good one and the good image, right, with the warmer walls, but it's not as busy of a bookshelf. It's not an disarray. It's out of focus. It's out of focus, and I uh -huh. think that's the key thing. Uh, it's far enough back that you can't really pick out individual images because believe it or not people get bored and they start looking around in an image for something else to look at and if you give it to them they'll look at it so i think in that uh, image with jeff carlson uh if you recall the the bookcase in the background was a little softer and out of focus interesting so as long as they can't read the spine then you're fine <laughs> yeah i think so and i just Look at it yourself. Are you distracted by it? Is there something in there that's really drawing your eye away from it? Well, then it's not so good. Find another background. Okay, thank you. So Aritra yeah. asks, would you suggest any simple post-processing steps for the 3MT videos? Um, in the past, we actually used to edit those. We did them, you know, when we were recording them in a, in a uh, auditorium. Right now, I don't know what to say on that. Uh, you're being re being recorded on Panopto. I don't know whether what options you may have uh, on that. I I just don't know. Um, that that would probably be the question for the administrator for the 3MT as to whether other options you have. From working with Panopto in the past, because we've you know uploaded fellowship panels and you know things like that you can it's very easy to use the clip you know the clip the, the, you can clip it very easily it's right there it's like little scissors like literally <laughs> there to, yep. to clip the yep. video so what you could do is play i would suggest playing around first record some willy-nilly thing that doesn't matter upload it and then see what features you you'd like to have you know in that way it'll give you some um abilities to if you wanted to clip or yeah, and I think along that same line, uh, that might be a good time for you to try out your slide. Uh, is this something that is cluttered and difficult to read when it's now on the smaller screen? Uh, so that might be a good way. If you can do a test recording uh, with your slide and then look at it, after, look at your recording afterwards, can you clearly see the slide and you um, or not? <laughs> and then to make adjustments accordingly. Mm -hmm. Melissa asks, will other mobile phones work for sound or just iPhone? Well, as a proud owner of an iPhone, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming so. I mean, I got to believe that, uh, you know, other iPhones have microphones on them. Uh, so it should. You do a test recording. I mean, try it. Uh, just remember, it's the proximity to the microphone that makes a huge difference. If the camera on your phone and the microphone is more than arm's length, I think you're going to start having a, some fall off. Um, but I, I would just try it. Mm -hmm. uh, so then Linda asked a question about copyright. In their experience, live academic conferences like classroom teaching have different copyright terms. But it sounds like since this is being recorded, is it just a given that it will be treated like a public recording or specifically for 3MT? And then in brackets, I mean, does this more strict sense of fair use copyright apply to all recordings for Yale purposes or specifically to this competition? That's a good question. I do recall that the 3MTs do end up on YouTube. I think I recall that. Um, I think it's a good practice, period. Uh, you know, just borrowing stuff because it's available is not a good way to live your life. <laughs> um, and the classroom exclusion is kind of narrow. So in other words, I think if you were to go to, to, go to the Office of General Counsel and take a look at their fair use uh, analysis tool, um, you'll see that, you know, there, there's, there's a narrow band there on what is still considered fair use in classroom. Um, so, you know, without giving any legal advice, I think the bottom line is try and get permission to these things or certainly 
put the attribution at the bottom. So in other words, it doesn't take too much uh, when you're putting together your slide to put an attribution of where you got it from uh, at the bottom in, you know, in small text. If anyone wants to set up a meeting, how can they get in touch with you? Send me an email. Okay. There is guy.ortoliva at yale.edu. Uh, send me an email and we'll see what we can do. I'm, I'm sure that people are not going to be breaking down my doors. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure we can find some time to help you. Thank you, Guy.